the North Sea is a hostile place. If you work on an oil rig or ship, the last thing you want is for a rope to break. In a laboratory, they're testing a steel rope. A machine pulls it, then releases it, hour after hour, day after day. Steel isn't the only strong material. Plastics can have great strength. This nylon rope is also undergoing a tensile test. By understanding the properties of nylon, how it behaves under different conditions, scientists hope to make sure that failures happen only in the safety of the laboratory. At MEL we test many different types of materials to measure the properties important to engineers. Early man had only primitive materials, uh, natural materials such as wood and flint. In time, copper and bronze, iron and steel was discovered and became very useful. But it's only in the 20th century that we have developed a wide range of technologies which have made many materials freely available to, to man. Materials are important to engineers because they enable them to convert their ideas for useful products into reality. Man's ideas for designs have often run ahead of the availability of materials. Just think, over 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci uh, had a design for a flying machine, which we now call a helicopter. It wasn't possible, of course, because the materials weren't available to build it from. We had to wait to the 20th century for that to happen. The arrival of new materials means that we can design things differently. Traditionally, this has been made out of high tensile steel, but it's very heavy. This type of component can be replaced now by special high-performance plastics, which are, by comparison, very light and yet have the same performance. This, of course, may not be the best way to use new materials. The spring is the traditional form. When we consider the best way to get the most out of the properties of these new plastics, we finish up with new shapes of components like this sulcated spring. New designs for traditional objects are possible only because scientists can make materials with exactly the right properties for the job. Take these gears, for example, from a power transmission. They can be made from a controlled mixture of metal powders and special additions. The properties can be tailored to produce precisely the effect we need uh, in terms of mechanical strength, resistance to wear and hardness. Get it right and we have a very reliable, strong gear. Get it wrong and we have problems. And getting it wrong can have serious consequences. We expect the things we build not to break. We want them to be strong. But what does the word strong mean to a scientist? Just strong is a very general term. It can be strong, but it could bend, which would be no good for a bridge or a car. Um, it could be strong, but it could shatter easily. This rope is strong. It's difficult to break by pulling it. In that sense, glass is also quite strong. But if you bend it with a blow, you can see it's brittle. Diamond is the hardest substance known. It's very difficult to dent or wear down. Now here we are, expense is no object, and here we go to break a diamond. One, two, three. But it's also brittle. Well, now here's another material, some rubber. You're all familiar with rubber. It's strong stuff, but the trouble is it's bendy. It's flexible. Rubber isn't rigid enough for some uses. Now, rubber isn't just uh, flexible, it's also elastic. When you stretch it, it comes back to more or less the same length again. And this is a very special property of rubber. But not all materials are like that. For example, we've got here a piece of copper wire and when you start to stretch it, it's only elastic over a very small little bit of the stretch. It will yield. But if I let go, it won't come back again. You see, it stayed at the final length. 
Copper is ductile. It can be pulled or squeezed into new shapes. The steel in this car is also ductile. It has changed shape, crumpled, and absorbed some of the energy of the crash. This vehicle has been involved, as you can see, in a very severe high-speed collision. It has, in fact, absorbed energy in the front part of the structure and the rear, but the passenger compartment has remained intact. Now, when one designs a vehicle, one needs to have a material which is both strong and ductile. And by a combination of materials and design, you can ensure that the passenger compartment will remain intact and the energy of the collision is absorbed by progressive deformation and buckling of the material, as here, without any cracking or brittle fracture. In most cars, that material is steel. It's made from molten iron, which has too much carbon in it to be of much use. Things made of cast iron are brittle, no good in a car crash. So a pipe is lowered into the molten iron and oxygen blown in. This combines with and removes most of the carbon, leaving behind a more ductile metal. The properties of mild steel are excellent for car bodies but for good fuel economy, cars must also be light, which means using as little steel as possible. It's no good using thinner steel because it crushes too easily. Unless you make a different kind of steel, which is stronger. If we carry out that crushing test on mild steel, then what happens is that we reduce the height of the box similar in fashion to what you see here. If we now lighten the structure by reducing the thickness of the material and do the same type of crushing test, as you can see here, the height of the box is then reduced. If we now increase the strength of the steel by substituting the same thickness as before, but now increasing the strength, and then carry out the crushing test again, you see that we now produce a box which is crushed less and is now of a height comparable with the thick, normal strength steel. Thinner, but just as strong. But there was a danger that this new high-strength steel would lack the ductility which allows it to be press-formed into shape. How do scientists control the combination of properties in a material so precisely? When we stretch the piece of copper wire, you might think that we pulled the atoms farther apart. But actually, this isn't what happens. In a crystal, a metal crystal, the atoms are in layers. And when we actually stretch a crystal, we slide one layer of atom over another, like that. The layers of atoms slide like playing cards in a pack. The way a ductile material behaves can be shown using soap bubbles. Imagine each bubble is an atom. The darting black lines show where the layers are sliding past each other. There's nothing to stop them. If this was a metal crystal, it would be changing shape in a ductile way. The sliding can be controlled by adding elements to the steel, such as niobium. It reacts with carbon to produce fine particles, which spread through the steel. You can only see what's going on under an electron microscope. The particles show up as black blobs. The thin black lines, where sliding has taken place, stop at the blobs. The layers of atoms can't slide past each other so easily. Niobium is controlling the ductility and strengthening the steel. So, scientists have learnt how to improve the properties of a material. High-strength steel is increasingly used to make cars lighter. But to achieve more dramatic reductions in weight, car makers have started to look at other materials altogether. This is British Leyland's experimental energy-saving car. There's still a good deal of metal inside it, but most of the bodywork is plastic. It's fast, economical, and doesn't rust. In order to get the best design and to maximize the weight savings, you have to break the vehicle body into two basic parts. Firstly, the structure, which has to carry all the main loads and indeed has to do all the energy absorption in major crashes. 
and secondly, the body skin panels, such as the bonnet, the wing, and the door. We don't want them to absorb large amounts of energy. The major thing we want there is to resist damage in small bumps and scrapes. So we built ECB3 with an aluminium structure and plastic skin panels. On the vehicle, the only part of the aluminium structure you can see is the roof and the sills. The remaining skins of the vehicle are made in plastic, stiffer materials for the bonnet, and the more flexible glass-reinforced polyurethane for the front and all the sides of the vehicle and the rear. Here is a wing off the car, and as you can see, this is very damage resistant, and it bounces back into shape. This material is polyurethane. How is it made? Basically, it's a two-component system. You start off with two mobile liquids. One of them uh, is uh, a syrupy liquid. The other is a dark isocyanate, uh, which is very much more mobile and runny. As the reaction proceeds, it gives out heat. That speeds up the reaction, and the two runny liquids become increasingly stiff until they eventually set solid. Just as with metals, scientists can change the properties of plastics by altering their chemistry. Remember that polymers consist of long chains of monomers. If we represent a monomer by this green bead, we can join the beads up together to, to form a two unit or a three unit, or we can continue until we get a long chain unit. A polymer, a chain of smaller molecules. One way of changing the properties of a given polymer type is to change the number of chains in the polymer. Uh, this piece of string represents a short chain polymer. We can also make longer chain polymers represented by this piece of string. The polymers are all tangled up in each beaker, but the short chains are not tangled up as much as the long chains. When long chain length polyethene is forced out of a hot barrel, it flows very slowly. The chains are tangled and can't slip past each other easily. The short chain length variety is much runnier. So different chain lengths, different properties. Another way to change the properties of a polymer is to put side groups onto the chain. Then adjacent chains lock together as the bulky side groups tangle up. For example, polystyrene has bulky side groups on the chain and this bar, when pulled, will snap and give a brittle fracture of the kind that you can see here. Polyethene, with slim chains and no side groups, behaves differently. If we take this bar and we stretch it, then the molecules will slip past each other to form a wasted section in which the molecules are pretty well all lined up. So the side groups affect the properties. There's also a way to make the polymer chains form branches, which link up with each other to give a cross-linked system. The chains can't slip, and the polymer is rigid and strong. There are many ways the shape of the molecules can be arranged to give plastics the properties you want. And you can also make new materials by using plastics and other substances, such as glass fibre, together in composites. Here in Lotus, we've been making reinforced plastic composite vehicles, uh, bodies, since 1957. The materials themselves are not new. Uh, we put them together in such a way that we can make our entire body structure. The materials we use are a combination of glass fibre, which in itself is not particularly strong, and resin, which, when it's in its unreinforced state, is very brittle. Uh, but when we put the two together, this forms a panel which is both stiff 
and strong. And this combination is used to make this entire body structure. The Lotus production method is to lay glass fibre in a mould. This is the mould for the bottom half of the car. Different weaves of fibre give strength in different directions. We know that glass has some undesirable properties, so it's surprising to find it in this flexible form being used to strengthen and reinforce a car body. Foam sections go in where the car needs a particularly rigid structure. This foam combination is used to create the structure around the door aperture, along the sill here, up the windscreen pillar and across the roof, and in combination with this steel beam in the door and a steel rollover bar in the roof, we have uh, a total structure. The rest of the body is entirely fibre reinforced composite. When the mould is laid up, it's closed. Then polymer resin is pumped in and flows through and surrounds the glass fibre. After several hours, half a car is ready to be removed. This time delay doesn't matter if you're making only a few cars a week. Glue is used to bond the bottom half to the top half. After painting and fitting out, the complete car body is ready to be dropped onto the engine and gearbox. A plastic composite bodied car which is light and rust proof and hasn't required expensive press forming machinery. The structural strength of a Lotus depends on plastics, whereas British Leyland's car uses plastics only as a skin over a metal structure. The plastics aren't contributing anything to the structural strength of the vehicle. They're essentially keeping the water out, and of course they are designed such that they're damage resistant. If you look at composites, they can absorb quite a lot of energy and compression, where they break into very small bits. But as soon as you put them in tension or bending, then they tend to break up into large lumps and don't absorb, absorb a lot of energy. Now, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to design a vehicle structure so that it would absorb or put the composites in compression in every vehicle accident. So I don't believe we will have plastics for the structural job in the car until they have the ability to absorb energy in the same way as steel does and have a ductile failure. Lotus are perfectly confident their cars can absorb energy in a crash and they're sure their way of using plastics is right. It differs somewhat from what we started doing in early Lotus days where in fact we tried to mould individual panels. There was a front wing, a left hand, right hand wing, rear wing and so on. And we tried to make those in plastic. It was almost like making a metal car in plastic materials. Now we use our moulding techniques to produce a much more complete moulding. We've learnt to modify the properties of materials now the challenge is to use those new materials in a new way.